morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Ravali and Nina John and Chira for uh, joining class this morning. Also, welcome to our in-person students and to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So I'll ask, uh, since the mic is near Nina Santosh, <laughs> Nina Santosh can lead us in prayer, please. Father God, we thank you. We bless you for this day, Father. We submit each one of us unto your loving hands, Lord. Lord, teach us your ways, Lord, and help us to do it every day of our life, Lord. We submit us, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so last week we uh, began looking at Chapter 3 in uh, Kingdom Builders. And uh, we began looking at, um, you know, how... Um, the work of the Holy Spirit, giving birth to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can learn some lessons from the Mary miracle. So we looked at, um, you know, how um, the Holy Spirit, um, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary conceived um, and she gave birth to the Son of God. Uh, how God's divine plan was unfolding uh, in history. Okay, um, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw that and we were looking at how, um, you know, we can give birth to the work of the Holy Spirit and um, through some of the lessons that we can learn from this Mary miracle. The first thing we looked at was the work of the Spirit is released um, to the earth at the appointed time. Okay, and we also saw that the work of the Spirit is released through ordinary people. Okay. Um, the third point is the work of the Spirit must be unadulterated, born purely of the Spirit. Okay, And the fourth one is the work of the Spirit might be a cause for uh, embarrassment. Okay, So we, uh, we stopped here. We are looking at point four. Okay, We know that uh, even though Mary con uh, conceived in a womb the Son of God, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. But did this bring her embarrassment? Yes, she could not go and tell anyone and everyone. No one would believe her uh, story. Okay, uh, But we see that God spoke to people who mattered to her. Okay, um, God spoke to Joseph in a dream. Um, also, the Holy Spirit came upon Elizabeth and she spoke. Uh, so those who mattered to, uh, uh, to Mary, you know, God spoke to them. So even when God, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, births a plan or his purposes in our life, um, you know, people may not, uh, people around us may not understand. Okay. Even if God calls you into full time ministry, maybe your family, your spouse, you know, may not understand, but, you know, uh, God would speak to them. God will speak to the select few who are very close to you. God will speak to them and they will understand uh, because God will speak into their hearts. So it's important at such times to stay around people who encourage you, you know, who press you forward uh, to release what God has placed in your heart and in your life. Okay. The next one is the fifth one is the work of the spirit is released through normal, natural process. Okay. We see that, you know, although Mary conceived in a womb was something supernatural, it was the work of the Spirit, but we see that Mary had to engage through the natural process. God could have, you know, uh, uh, on the first day, get Mary conceived to the power of the Holy Spirit. Second day, the baby could have come to full term, nine months. The third day, the baby could have been born. But we see that... Now, God allowed it to go through the natural human process of pregnancy and delivery. So what does it teach us? You know, when God initiates um, his work in us by the Holy Spirit, we also need to co-labor with God. Okay. And, uh, uh, and when we co-labor with God by his empowering grace, you know, we can see his work released here on the earth, which means that even though things are birthed into us supernaturally, and of course, God is going to give us the grace and the gifts to fulfill the function that he is calling us to, we need to make our own 
sacrifices okay there is sacrifices that is involved we need to work hard we need to persevere we need to organize we need to manage things uh, we just can't sit back and say you know hey this is a work of god i'll just sit back and relax god will just do it he'll just speak things will fall into place he will orchestrate things yes he orchestrate things but it's important for us to work hard persevere plan you know organize things and manage what needs to be done the sixth thing is um, we might encounter close doors until we reach god's appointed place okay now some of these things which we are learning in this chapter in the next chapter is what we already studied in fulfilling god's purpose for your life and in the publication receiving god's guidance okay in uh, ministers foundation quite a repetition so when we face closed doors not every door is a closed door is a no from god okay we learned that in for, uh, in um, uh, receiving god's guidance and the publication code of honor not every door is a closed door which means that god wants us to enter even though we are carrying god's purposes we're going to birth his purposes it means that when god closes doors it doesn't mean that you know his it's not his purpose or it's you know that we're not fulfilling his purpose it's just that he's telling us this is not the right place he wants to birth it this is not the right place this is not the with the right people this is not the right time so you know we need to come to the place where we can birth god's purposes the right place um and the right timing so in the in the case of mary you know where they mary and joseph had to travel to bethlehem and she was full term and they were knocking on every inn door and imagine there was no place for them in any of the inns it must have come as a big um, shock to them disappointment you know uh, discouragement frustration um, uh, they could have even questioned our uh, mary could have even questioned am i really carrying the son of god you know in my womb if it's really the son of god you know god should you know prepare the best of the best inns in bethlehem for us but every inn has shut its uh, door and there was no room available what was only available the cattle shed okay and they would never have envisioned or imagined that the son of god would be born in such a place okay so what does that teach us when we are birthing god's purpose which the holy spirit has you know uh, put into us yeah uh, we can face closed doors which means it does not mean that you know it's not god's purpose um it only means that when there's closed doors god is directing us to the place where he wants us to release what he is birthing in and through us so we need to keep moving and moving till we come to the right place where god wants his work to be released and not get frustrated and disappointed and think this is not god's purpose am i really fulfilling god's purpose okay the next thing is the work of the spirit often has simple humble beginnings see the son of god was born where in the cattle shed and where was what was his manger his manger was an animal uh feed trough okay where you put food for the animals to eat so we see that it was not in a palace it was not in a rich man's house it was not in the best of the best five star or three star inns in bethlehem okay uh, so what does it teach us it teaches us that when god releases his work in and through us it does not come with great grandeur pomp show you know um, uh, with big dhamaka like you know uh, with the big noise and all of those things it comes in very simple humble small beginnings okay but even though it's simple small humble beginnings it is something that is going to be really a dhamaka in the sense it's going to be really powerful it is going to impact the entire world and um, uh, you know two scripture passages that we can talk about this uh, on this point is zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 it says not by might not by power but by my spirit okay and zechariah the same chapter was 10 was four, chapter 4 was 10 says who has despised the day of small things mm -hmm. so don't this despise this day of small things or small beginnings um you know don't get disappointed it is still god's uh, work but he begins some things in very humble small ways okay the next one is the work of the spirit has to be protected and 
nurtured. Okay, so we see that um, you know uh, Mary and Joseph they did they take care of baby Jesus. Yes, they did nurture, take care of the child when there was harm and danger, when the, the, the angel of God told him, get up, go to Egypt. You know, they went and then the time came um, to leave Egypt, said go back uh, to uh, Judah. They did come back. So we see that, you know, they, they did take care of baby um, Jesus. Okay. Uh, Mary didn't say, hey, this is a supernatural birth. This is a son of God. This is God. I don't have to take care of. God, he himself can take care of himself or God can send his angels to take care of him. I don't need to do, take care of him. You know, uh, that would be would have been foolish. But we see that Mary and Joseph, they take care of baby Jesus. They nurture him, protect him as their uh, parents. Okay. So what do we learn? That every work of God that is birthed in us, his purposes has to be nurtured and protected. Okay. Um, just because it's the work of God, it does not mean that we be irresponsible. We have to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. And whatever he has given to us, we need to do it with excellence and we need to do it well. Okay. So that is um, the work of the Holy Spirit in, um, in helping us to be kingdom builders and how through um, the Mary miracle, uh, you know, we can learn some of the uh, things that, um, you know, how uh, the Holy Spirit births his plans and purposes through our lives. Okay. So that is chapter three. Anyone has any questions? Chapter three. About the Holy Spirit as our director in us being kingdom builders. Any questions? No? Okay, there are no questions. We'll move on to chapter 4. Um, the nature of a God-given uh, vision. Okay. Um, we studied, again, this uh, quite in detail in, um, uh, 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 in your first year, first semester in Minister's Foundation. But we will look at a few things to reiterate, or we look at most of it to reiterate what we have learned. Okay. So this, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, is our director, even as he directs us in kingdom building, even as we are kingdom builders. And we know that the Holy Spirit communicates to us how does he communicate to us? Through, his, through the word also? Uh, through prophecy, okay? Through people? Through dreams and visions, okay? What else? The prompting, stirrings, inner witness of the Holy Spirit, all of that. Uh, we have learned okay so the holy the spirit of god communicates to us through dreams and visions now when we talk about dreams and visions we are not only talking about something that is supernatural supernatural spiritual experiences of god but it is also something that we can refer to when the holy spirit is giving us ideas dreams purposes goals strategies that he wants to birth in us as his people okay so when we talk about dreams and visions we're not just talking about supernatural spiritual experiences of god but we're also talking about how the holy spirit uses dreams and visions to birth in us his people his plans goals purposes and uh, dreams okay and um, you, uh, uh, you know um, through visions and dreams um, it, it's not just some heavenly entertainment for us okay like when we see pictures or uh, you know movie scene or something like that but every vision and dream that the holy spirit gives to us is he's communicating you know his desire that uh, what god wants to execute here on earth or what he wants to birth here on Earth. So every dream and vision that the Holy Spirit gives to us is pregnant or full, you know, uh, waiting to give birth to the kingdom purposes um, that God wants to be fulfilled in and through us. Okay. So in this chapter, we are going to basically understand how God imparts his visions and how God takes us on this journey 
to see his vision fulfilled. So it's so wonderful that God just does not give us dreams and visions, but also how he takes us on this journey, how he prepares us and how he guides us and leads us to fulfill this vision and the uh, dream or the plan and the purpose he's giving to us. And you know how in the process, how to carry out his purposes, his plans that he has for his kingdom here on earth okay so even as we study this as kingdom builders it will help us or enable us to walk uh, accurately with god and to know how god is preparing us uh, to fulfill his plans dreams and visions okay so in this chapter there are 11 insights um, uh, concerning god given vision okay the first one is that the god given vision is a divine command and an authorization Okay, so it is something that is um, divine command and authorization means the authorization is coming from heaven. Okay, it's a command that's coming from God. It's a God given vision that he wants to establish and extend here on the earth. So since it's a command, what should we do? A command has to be followed. It has to be obeyed. Okay, and what does authorization do? When we have an authority, what do you do? When you have, yeah, you have the power, okay? You have the boldness. You have the confidence. So you can, you can, you, you suppose, um, you know, Francis wants, has some announcement to make to your second years. So he says, um, okay, he comes and makes the announcement. Then all of you are, you know, very upset and say, hey, come on, Francis, this cannot happen. We have so many ass assessments, so many assignments, not possible at all. He says, I don't know, this Pastor Nancy said. Okay, and then uh, you'll go to Pastor Nancy and said, "Oh, this, 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 this," and then she says, "I don't know." Pastor Ashley just said, "Okay," so that is a divine authorization and a divine authorization. Whoever says it, you know, says it with boldness. There's there's no fear and there is confidence, and whatever has been said has to be followed. So even as we carry God's um, vision, we have this divine. Um, command which has to be obeyed and also we can have this boldness this confidence and be fearless okay sometimes when we're carrying or most of the time when we're doing god's plan and purpose for our lives you know we can shy away we can be afraid uh, we can feel incompetent we can feel um you know um that you know we are not able we are not able to do it but then we need to be bold fearless and confident why should we be that uh, uh, be bold fearless and confident because when it is god's vision for our life it is backed up with god okay all of heaven is backing us up you know and um, uh, it is um, god who will enable us who is committed 100 percent to see that vision fulfilled in and through us because it is his plan his vision for his kingdom to be executed here on earth and to be his kingdom to be executed here and extended here on earth okay so nothing can stop us from fulfilling this god-given vision and dream only what can stop us ourselves yes our own unwillingness, our own in feeling of incompetence or our feeling of, um, you know, failure or that we can't do it. Nothing can stop us from fulfilling God's vision and dream. Okay. Now, the one that God gives the vision to becomes a vision bearer. That means he bears that vision okay so what does he do when he bears that vision okay god wants him to execute that vision here on earth through that so uh, uh, when god wants to execute his vision here on earth he raises up a person he gives them the vision they become the vision bearer and then he births that vision in a certain place okay and so the person who has this vision is proclaiming the message and what is he doing? He's not doing it all by himself. He's, you know, when he's proclaiming the message, he's sharing his vision, he's tearing the hearts of other people around him to come and join his vision. So when God gives us a vision, it's not for I, me, myself, and I, me, myself to do it by myself individually, but it is also co-laboring, co-partnering, uh, co-partnering and co-working with 
others. God wants others to labor in our uh, vision. Okay, so He stirs up people um, who are like-minded, who will be the right people uh, to fulfill your the plan and vision for your life, and He will bring about that purpose. He will fulfill that purpose in your life. Okay, so also God raises a man. Okay. Um, man means uh, very, uh, human being generic, okay, man and woman, and uh, whose vision is to fulfill a specific uh, purpose of God. And God uh, gets him to uh, proclaim this message or gives him a ministry that, um, you know, through which he can fulfill his plan and vision. And he becomes a vision holder or the vision bearer. And then he carries out his vision. And how does he do it? He finds different methods, different strategies, comes up with different plans. And he also incorporates different people uh, into his um, uh, method and strategy who are uh, skilled and talented in those specific areas who can do, uh, who can help in bringing about that vision and, uh, you know, carry it out and fulfill God's divine purpose. Okay. So we look at a few examples of uh, men of God in the Bible to see how God worked through them. They were the vision bearers, but we will see how God worked through them. Okay. So the first example is um, uh, Moses. Okay. Sorry. The first example, yes, is Moses. Okay. So we see that, you know, when Moses was, um, you know, uh, almost 40 years old, we read in Acts chapter 7, verse 23, says when he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. That means at the age of 40, he knew what was his divine calling, plan and purpose. So he was the vision bearer. Okay, God stirred up his heart. Uh, to come to a place where he can use Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt. And so also we see that, you know, God um, um, had a plan and purpose before that as well. He had, uh, you know, purpose that he would be born, you know, taken into the palace and be trained to be the next Pharaoh, the leader of um, Egypt. So all these were the seeds in his life. And all this was God's divine orchestration of circumstances in his life to bring him to a place where he can birth God's vision of delivering his uh, people. Okay, so we see that sometimes God's vision can come through a simple stirring in our heart or prompting in our heart, you know, um, something that really captures and holds our heart. Or sometimes there can be something like, you know, something that will really catch our attention, okay, like the burning bush. For Moses, there were two things. There was a stirring in his heart, and he came to know what was his divine call and purpose. That was to deliver his people out of Egypt, because he knew he was not an Egyptian. He was an uh, Israelite. And also, after 40 years, when he had messed up at the age of 80, God used the burning bush, um, you know, um, uh, to catch his attention. Okay, so sometimes God can use a burning bush to get our attention. Uh, and it's a place where a burning bush is a place where God's presence, where God, God's voice is released to um, reveal your call and your destiny. So some for some people, it can be like the burning bush experience, where they can experience the presence and the voice of, the, of, of God. Sometimes it can just be a stirring in your heart. Okay, so we see that um, in the when he was 40 years old, there was a stirring in his heart. But 40 years later, God encountered Moses through the burning bush. Okay, so um, uh, we also look at Nehemiah's life. Okay, Nehemiah, what did Nehemiah do? What did Nehemiah do? The, the build the walls of. Jerusalem. It was ruined. The walls had broken down. The gates were burned down. And where was Nehemiah? Was he in Jerusalem? Yes, he was in um, uh, in in Sushan, uh, Persia. Okay, and um, one of his brothers, Jewish brothers, who had gone to Jerusalem, come back. You know, uh, Nehemiah asked an update. Okay, what? How is the situation in Jerusalem? 
So he says, you know, walls are broken down and, you know, the gates are burned down. Now I'm sure, uh, um, you know, um, uh, Hanani, the, the brother who shared this, would have shared this news with many other Jews, okay? But no one's her heart was stirred up like Nehemiah's heart was stirred up. And what, what did Nehemiah do when he heard this? He wept and mourned and fasted and prayed. It was not just for one day, two days. It was almost for three months. So much so that he was so grieved, so saddened, so depressed that the king could know that something is really wrong with, um, uh, with uh, Nehemiah. Okay. So sometimes the Holy Spirit births his vision in and through us through a stirring in our hearts. So we need to pay attention to those stirring in our hearts. And we see that, you know, God led Nehemiah to carry out his mission okay he goes to jerusalem and he um uh, carries out the divine plan and vision so why did god stir up his heart it was basically for him to go and do it why nehemiah we don't know but if you look at the book of nehemiah we can look and you know we can uh, use our wisdom or knowledge to understand that he was in a very prominent place of leadership next now the king, very close to the king, the most trusted person. You know, the, the king would ask for wine and he would pour it and give. That means they had to be the most trusted person. Okay. So he was somebody so close to the king and so he could get authorization from the king. He could get uh, materials. He could get permission. He could get leave. He could get the money. He could get um, uh, protection. Everything the king provided for uh, him okay so if it was somebody else it would have been difficult because if you read the book of nehemiah we know that there was it was not very easy for them to build the walls okay a lot of uh, the neighboring the, the the people the arabs were giving him a lot of trouble three people sanballat and uh, tobia i think and uh, tobia sanballat and somebody else hornet or something okay and so they 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 get caused a lot of problem and difficulty for Nehemiah okay but Nehemiah because he had the king's authorization and the permission and everything things had become so much more easier so we see that you know God uh, stirred up his heart and he followed that stirring and he did something about it and God was able to birth his plan and purpose through um, Nehemiah okay the third thing is that a God-given vision has appointed time for initiation and execution okay we know that god works in chronos time and kairos time okay so look at acts chapter 7 verse 17 and 20 can somebody read that please Acts 7 17 and 20 uh, but when the time kairos of uh, but the but when the time of the promise drew near when god had sworn to abraham the people grew and multiplied in egypt at this time Moses was born and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. Amen. So here we see that, um, you know, but when the time of the promise drew near, that means God had promised Abraham that your descendants will, or your children's children will be as slaves in an unknown country, foreign country for 400 years. So the time was the Kronos time. All this time God was preparing, orchestrating things, okay, did everything. Um, and it was now the Kairos moment. So the verse 17, but when the time of the promise, so it is a Kronos time. Okay, it was not the fullness of time, but the time was nearing the Kairos time. And it says, at this time, M Moses was born. That was a Kairos time. Okay, so the Kairos time is the fullness of time when the time is ripe, when the time is near, when the, it's the fulfillment of the birthing of God's plan and purpose. Okay, so when the Kairos time uh, is, uh, or the fullness of time is approaching, you know, um, there are two things. There's both external and internal factors, okay? So for uh, the Kairos moment um, or the time of season for the initiation and the execution of God's given vision, there is something like the external and the internal factors. So what is the external factors? People, 
okay uh, the uh, uh, you know the vision bearer he needs people around him to help him execute the vision that god has given him so there are some people that god would remove there are some people sorry okay there are some people that god would remove out of the way there are some people that god would bring into your life the right people and um, sometimes you know it's a previous generation that is runs its course and makes way for the next generation also god prepares the place he takes the person who's the vision bearer uh, to the right place to execute his plan and his vision okay and also we see that you know um, god prepares the things that are surrounding the vision bearer like the family okay the people around uh the tribe or the culture uh and also his finances so all of these things to come together at the kairos moment so these are external factors what are the internal factors right heart attitudes we saw all this in um, ministers foundation right heart attitudes right relationship with people uh, maturity and spiritual development in uh, various areas of our life putting our personal a uh, family a uh, personal life and our family uh, home everything in discipline and in order uh, possessing the heart of a servant uh, being faithful in little things and christ like character okay we studied all of this in quite a lot of detail uh, in ministers foundation okay so um we can you know the when the kairos moment comes we can either uh, you know uh, bring it into fulfillment birth god's plan and purpose or we can delay things how do we delay things yeah by not being uh, you know uh, external factors and internal factors are not in the right place that means we are not managed our finances our family is not ready or we are um, you know um we are not in the right place okay and we don't have the right people or the internal factors you know not having the right heart attitudes christ like character so you know uh, there are several um, uh, uh, so they all of these things need to come to place when the kairos moment comes so that we can birth god's plan and purpose so so sometimes when you know hey i am um, I think it's the right time for me to birth God's plan and purpose but things are not happening why is it not happening then you can look at the external and the internal factors okay but there is not is there only one kairos moment in our life and one chronos moment uh, why why are there many okay god works that means i'm saying that there are various plans god has always so much more for us god takes us to different seasons in life right and every season has its own plan and purpose and he's preparing us for the ultimate plan and purpose so in every season he's preparing us for his plan and purpose and we need to be like the sons of issachar understanding and knowing the times and the seasons okay so we need to understand the times and seasons as god is taking us through even as he unfolds his dreams his visions to be fulfilled in and through our lives okay yes anand you have a question when we see this uh, context and this differences how we can easily that uh, i mean identify this chronos and kairos okay how do we identify chronos and uh, kairos for example when we look at joseph's life okay now or we look at um, uh, 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 david's life now david was only 13 years old when he was um, uh, you know was anointed as king by samuel and joseph was a very young boy okay so we'll study that uh, but it took so many years of their life 17 or plus years for them to come into uh, the fulfillment of their dreams or plans or what the prophet samuel had spoken over david so all of that in 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 this example if you look 400 years was a chronos time when god was orchestrating things and preparing things like how 
Joseph had to go to Egypt, how he had to bring his uh, brothers and his father and their families, and how, you know, they had to stay in Egypt. And at the right time, at the, uh, at the right moment, 400 years, the Kairos moment when Moses was born, uh, and why was not Moses killed like any of the other Hebrew babies, and God, why did God um, um, preserve him? It's not because he was partial, not because that he, he, he had already predestined or pre-planned that Moses is going to be, um, uh, you know, the leader. And so he saved him and killed the other babies because he did not have a plan and purpose for them. No, that's not right. He has a plan and purpose for everyone. It's because of the step of faith that um, Moses' parents had taken, okay? If the other Hebrew parents had taken the same step of faith, you think the babies would have been protected? Yes, because God is not partial, okay? So... It all led up to the Kairos moment when Moses was born and that also God was planning and preparing. And when he was at the age of 40 was when God stirred up his heart, the Kairos moment for birthing it. Okay, So there was the external factors and the internal. The external factors was God was arranging people um, around him. God was arranging um, uh brought him to the right place Moses to the right place in the in the uh, uh, in the palace and then all of these external uh, the son but what happened to in Moses's life you know he took things matters into his own and and delayed those things more further okay so even in David's life okay David was the son but there was you know because of King Saul all the things that happened we'll study that okay how God prepares us. Okay, the fourth thing is a God-given vision requires preparation. We studied quite a bit of this in um, the first year of Minister's Foundation. Okay, God prepares us before he births his plan and his vision, his calling and his gifting um, uh, through us. Okay, um, so the primary preparation is our personal spiritual walk with God and also growth into Christ-like character. Okay. So even when God is preparing us, you know, um, he will give us opportunities to work alongside with others, uh, to get into others' vision sometimes so we can learn um, uh, to, you know, uh, to work alongside leaders, great men and women of God, so we can learn from them. And all this is going to help us immensely to birth our own dreams and uh, visions so that we can be fully trained and equipped to fulfill God's plan and purpose for our lives. Okay. Um, sometimes when God is preparing us, we can find ourselves doing something that is not directly related to the vision that God has placed in our heart. Okay. So what do we do at those times? You know, as those times, as at those times, we just have to learn. Okay. We just have to go through the seasons. We just learn. Uh, sometimes it, we can feel that it's very disconnected. Okay, um, but however, God is preparing us, He's developing us in the areas that are important for us to fulfill His plan and purpose uh, through our um, lives. Okay, so in the the preparation time is never wasted time. Okay, we learned that you know for some of them the preparation time was seventeen years, thirty years, like Moses and Paul and David, um, and even Jesus had to wait thirty years okay um but our focus should be that we should be yielded to god's um uh, yielded submitted in total surrender in every and each season of our lives okay so let's look at some of the preparation processes that god takes people through so we look at some um men of god in the bible okay can you just pass the mic to him please the first person we look at is uh, the life of uh, Joseph, okay. Uh, about the preparation time you are telling some for some people it is something years for some like so uh, like uh, but in the case of Moses we see like uh, it was delayed because he did things in his own so so my question is like uh, the preparation time. Will it depend on us? Like if we being more obedient, the preparation time will go fast. But if you are not being obedient, if we are doing things on our way, not submitting, 
the preparation time will be long. Yes, that's why we talked about the Kairos moment. The Kairos moment, the birthing of the Kairos moment depends on the external and internal factors. If we can delay things, delay is not from God, but delay is from us. Because God does not is not in a hurry to birth, to pour out his anointing through vessels that are not prepared. It will waste his anointing. It will, it will, uh, it will, instead of extending God's kingdom, it will become a hindrance. The person is not prepared. The person is not in the right place. The right people along with him. He's not mentally prepared, you know. So he's not uh, spiritual enough. Spiritual maturity is not there. Christ-likeness is not there. It is going to actually, uh, going to become a, uh, bring a downfall. Okay. And it's going to not only destroy uh, the vision that God has for uh, him. Uh, God can use someone else, but it's going to destroy so many people's life associated with the vision. Bearer. So God is very mindful of um, that. Okay. So let's look at the life of Joseph. Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold as a, a slave. Okay. And he, when he was 30 years old, he was brought out of prison. Okay. So he spent a whole 13 years in Egypt, 11 years as, um, as a slave and then a manager in Potiphar's house, and then two years in the prison. And then we see that, you know, um, for another nine years, he uh, faithfully serves as a prime minister in Egypt. And when he was 39 years old, he the first time he gets to see his brothers. And when he was probably 41 years old, second time his brothers come along with his uh, father. So it took approximately 30 years from the time he had the dream to the time of the fulfillment when his brothers came and bowed down before him okay and then he spent how many years 70 years fulfilling god's purpose for his um, life okay so we see that um, uh, for joseph it happened when he was 40 years old so don't be in a hurry okay um, and it's important even though it happened late it is important that you continue to walk in the vision and the plan and purpose that god has for your life. So he walked in it for the next 70 years. Let's look at Moses's life. Okay. Um, Moses, uh, we know that his seed or spiritual destiny was that he was taken and raised up in the palace. And thus it was his initial preparation and uh, him positioning himself to be the leader. Okay. So being uh, the, uh, uh, in the in the palace, he was destined to be the next leader for Egypt. So it was easy for him to send away his uh, people to their own land. So God orchestrated those things and also training him up to be a leader. He was trained mentally, physically, you know, uh, in every way to be um, the next pharaoh, the next ruler. And at the age of 40, he, you know, he had the stirring in his heart and he knew that he had a divine purpose and his purpose was to not just rule over Egypt, but to deliver his people okay but he made a mistake he tried to accomplish it through his own um, wisdom his own understanding his own carnal nature so every time we do things in our own carnal nature now fleshy nature what happens we delay god's uh, plan and purpose for our lives okay so we see here that moses tried to attempt to do it all by himself okay but it's important that we do it with God and with people who God brings about in our lives. It only delayed things by another 40 years. Okay. So what did Moses have to do the next 40 years? He had to live in the wilderness, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. Okay. From the palace to the wilderness to being a shepherd. Okay. And then God had to wait for another 40 years. Why? Because Pharaoh, the, the king, the Pharaoh who knew uh, Moses had to die. So what took uh, 400, should have taken 400 years, it took 440 years or 400 and, yeah, 440 years. It took 440 years because of what Moses did, okay? But we see that, um, uh, you know, Moses um, was able to, uh, carry out God's life assignment for his life. But again, because of a mistake he made, he was not able to enter the promised land. Okay, Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. 
again. So he died at the age of 20, but he fulfilled God's plan and purpose for his life, but sadly could not enter the promised land. Okay. Uh, look at the life of David. David was 13 years old when he was anointed as king. Okay. And uh, what was his initial training? You know, he killed a lion and the bear as a shepherd. He was also a musician. And so he was well known among his people. Okay. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17 and 23, and 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 15, we see that he was already a hero in the lives, in the hearts and minds of people of Israel. Okay. And then his uh, success came when he killed Goliath. Okay. But even though he was successful and people loved him, you know, uh, King Saul uh, made him a commander of thousand and, uh, people and sent him to fight battles, thinking that he would die in the battle. But we see that, you know, God protected David. And what happened for the rest of, uh, as long as Saul lived, Saul was running behind whom? David he was chasing behind him. So we see that David was running away from King Saul. He was like a, you know, he was like a vagabond running, uh, living in caves, you know, um, and um, um, for a long time. But during those times, he did some great exploits and God brought people into David. There were 400 strong men army that he had. And some of these men were people who became generals in his army when he became king. Okay. Now, when uh, David was 23 years old, he became king of only Judah. Right. And he ruled there for seven years and uh, six months. And then at the age of 30, he was finally made king over entire Israel and Judah. And so he reigned as king for the next 40 years. Okay. So it took 17 years from the time of his calling or his anointing as king to him becoming the king of Israel and Judah. Okay. So seven uh, from the age of 15 to age of 30, so 17 um, years. And then he served God's purpose in his generation and he died around when he was 70 to 75 years. We look at the life of Paul. Paul must have been 33 years when he met, when he encountered uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus. And soon after that, you know, he was, he spent three years in, uh, in, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, he spent three years in Damascus and then in Arabia. Uh, why did he have to flee to Arabia? Because people tried to kill him. He, as soon as he uh, encountered Christ, he started preaching the gospel. So the Jews were against him. They wanted to kill him. So he ran away. Uh, to Arabia. And that is where they say that, you know, uh, he received most of his revelation. Okay. And then we see that he visited Jerusalem for 15 days. And during that time, people tried to kill him. Then he went to Tarsus and he spent time 13 years in Tarsus in Syria and Sicilia. And, um, you know, towards the end of those 13 years, uh, Barnabas comes to Tarsus and, and brought Saul to Antioch. And so Saul spends a whole year in Antioch teaching and preaching. Then after 14 years, he goes back to Jerusalem. Okay. So it is 17 years from the time he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus to his first missionary journey. And the 17 years are called as the silent years of Paul. Not that he really didn't do anything. He received most of his revelations during that time. He also preached and taught in the synagogues, not that he was not doing anything, but it was 17 years. And Paul must have been about 50 years old when he began his ministry. Okay. So um, if you are thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm 25 or 30 or 35, 40 years, don't worry. Paul was 50 years, but look at the immense work that God fulfilled in and through um, Paul. Okay. So we see that um, the 17 years, silent years, was Paul's uh, training period. Okay. Um, Jeremiah, he was um, the next person, Jeremiah, was given his prophetic call even before he was born. 
okay and god told um, him not to allow people to let to know he let him know he was too young but from the time he had the first utterance or the first visitation uh, to his first prophetic utterance it took 16 years that means for the first time when god visited him to the time that he made his first prophetic utterance how many years did it take 16 years so we see that from the time that god gives us his vision uh, to the appointed time when he wants to be executed and bring it to fulfillment you know there is a time of preparation okay so during this preparation time there is also a waiting time and we'll see what we need to do during the waiting time after the break okay we'll stop here and come back after the break